Hello, my name is Maria Helena Carey, and um, I run a blog called The Hill is Home, and I have partnered up with Julie Aronson from Champs, and I will let her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Julie Aronson. I'm the Executive Director of Champs, the Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce. Our mission is to advocate, connect, and promote our small businesses here on Capitol Hill. And today we are talking to Marcus Batchelor, who is a candidate for a council member at large. So Marcus, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for, for having me and for hosting this discussion for all of our neighbors ahead of what is going to be a very important election. Uh, my name is Marcus Batchelor. Uh, I currently serve as the Ward 8 representative and vice president of the DC State Board of Education, uh, where I've been elected for the last about four years to represent 16,000 young people east of the Anacostia River in Southeast and Southwest, uh, but also all DC kids. Uh, and before that, also served as an advisory neighborhood commissioner, um, but have really uh, preceded that work by over a decade in both uh, government and nonprofit, really working on the ground to solve some of our community's most entrenched and toughest issues for our neighbors uh, left furthest behind. Uh, you know, I think uh, I'm, I was really excited to, to join you for this conversation today because when we talk about the Hill is home, actually uh, the Hill was my family's first home when my family uh, moved to DC, uh, when my grandmother and grandfather moved to DC. Uh, over 70 years ago um, and bought a, and rented a home on the hill uh, about two blocks from Lincoln Park on 11th Street. Uh, and in the first wave of, of what was uh, displacement in the city of, of Black residents ended up moving east of the Anacostia River to Congress Heights, uh, where I grew up and currently live and, and have been able, I had the pleasure to serve my neighbors in my community uh, since then. Uh, Last year, we decided, uh, I decided that I was going to seek uh, a seat for the city council. I think we've been running for about 314 days uh, and, uh, and didn't take that decision lightly, but, uh, but thought that it was important uh, that we lend a voice uh, in this race that was both rooted in our communities that had experienced um, uh, D.C. really both at its best and at its worst. I, you know, came through the public school system, but grew up uh, in, uh, in one of D.C.'s most uh, entrenched and impoverished communities. And while I was, uh, had the opportunity to have a loving family and a great community network and a great public education, so many of my friends didn't. Uh, and so when I think about the progress that DC now has to make in this new era, talking about not just the next four years, but the next 40, it's really about building the equity that is, that's gonna make stories like mine more possible for young people who look like me uh, around the city. And so we started this campaign back in September focused on a few big issues. One uh, is that we wanted to create a moral economy that both expands and protects folks' rights uh, to live and wage work. Uh, we wanna fight for truly affordable housing and that means truly affordable for folks across the income spectrum uh, so that everybody can find a place to live that is both safe and with dignity. Uh, it means uh, creating safe and accessible communities with both uh, that are both ripe with opportunity, but also free uh, from gun violence. Um, it's about having, uh, uh, I think, finally, a response to COVID uh, that not just returns us to a new normal, but really builds, um, really builds a new beginning for DC that, again, is focused more on equity, focused on making sure all boats really rise with the tide. And so I'm really excited to have been around the city for the past few months, really talking to neighbors about that vision, having us uh, inform that vision with real tangible plans to get that work done. Uh, and uh, I think the tremendous opportunity we have, not just on November 3rd, but over the next four years to really build a citywide coalition uh, that's gonna make that work possible. Uh, so really excited to be a candidate in the now very crowded field. Uh, we were the first in, uh, but with a, <laughs> now a very crowded field. Uh, to, to really push that vision and, and promote that work, yeah. Wonderful, well thank you for that very thorough introduction. Um, yeah. So let us keep going from there and sure. how do you plan to stand out? The field, I mean, obviously you've done a fair amount of legwork and uh, you've raised your profile already. You were, as you said, the first one in the race, but now there are 24 other candidates. So um, how do you think that uh, you can stand out and uh, do you think that there is an unfair advantage from better known names that are running? 
Yeah, well, you know, I think the thing that most excited me about this race, especially particularly this cycle, um, was that I guess pre-COVID really gave uh, candidates with you know, not the amount of name recognition that a traditional candidate in this space would have to have or not the network of right money and, and uh, connections that would usually be necessary. You know, the fair elections program, for instance, gave uh, little known candidates or folks doing good work in their communities who really wanted to take that to the next level an opportunity to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited that we were one of the first campaigns uh, to qualify for the fair elections program, which means we're taking small dollar contributions from Washingtonians and really putting them in charge of our message. I, I think when we talk about coming down the stretch in a very crowded field, uh, it's going to be about building on, for sure, some of the things we've already done, building that citywide network of energetic folks who are really ready uh, for real change. But I think uh, as we really close the deal and really convince people about why it's important to elect the right leadership, uh, I think it's about both my experience and my perspective. So I talked a little bit about the work I had done on the State Board of Education, but also on the ground in my professional career, really doing the real work to close gaps and build opportunities for folks. We need somebody with both that experience and that perspective to make sure that that translate in the way we create policy in government. But on top of that, right, my DC story, I think follows a pretty uh, remarkable arc in our city's history that for sure is better than it was when I was born, right, in the city's only public hospital in 1993, uh, but still has a long way to go to close the tremendous divides that are leaving people that look like me behind, right? When we talk about, right, the, the median incomes of white residents in this city that skyrocketed over the past decade, and then talk about the median income of black families that is stagnated and is actually lower than it was at the height of the financial crisis in 2008. We really have a real gap and a real problem that we have to solve and electing somebody to government with that real tangible experience of not just working on those issues, but really living them in a real way, I think is, is so important. And I think that's the message we'll take the voters and hopefully it resonates. Um, so, you know, springboarding off that, uh, there, there are the, the, each council member has a geographical area, mm -hmm. except that the a large seats are citywide. Um, yes. How do you see an at-large office as more than just a backup for citizens when they're having a hard time getting a hold of their um, geographically appropriate council member? And yeah. how would you raise the profile of your office in particular to help all Washingtonians? Yeah, well, you know, uh, one of our uh, one of our I guess unofficial slogans is that we want to create a city that works for all of us, and that really takes making sure we elect a council member that's going to work for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, again, talking about very tangible experience I have, right? As an advisory neighborhood commissioner uh, in Congress Heights, I served uh, for a term serving residents in both Congress Heights and Washington Highlands. That on the ground work to really make government feel real and responsive was a part. Uh, of my work. And then, you know, at the same time I was an advisory neighborhood commissioner, I also worked in the mayor's office of community relations and services. Uh, and I know a lot of your neighbors are probably familiar with the mokers uh, in your community who do that work. I was a ward eight moker and really worked hard to build both the relationships in the community, but also do the tough work of making government feel more present in communities where uh, government didn't feel present very often. And so when we talked about, you know, the things like getting the potholes filled and getting the trash picked up, that was a part of my job too. But it was also really getting down deep into communities and talking about the real issues and getting people to buy in and weigh in. Uh, and I think that, that we need somebody on the council who's gonna be both a policymaker and a community leader, somebody who has that experience with bringing a diverse group of voices to the table uh, and really being able to work on real solutions to, to our toughest issues. And I have you know, uh, years of experience doing that and wanna, wanna for sure make sure that that translate in, into the at-large office. I plan to be uh, present and not hands off with constituent service, which uh, you know, I think some members see as a luxury, but I think it's a necessity that we make government feel present in people's lives because that's the way you really build the type of, of, of representative democracy you need to make sure the city works for everyone. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Julie's questions right now. Sure. Thank you for being with us today. Um, 
A common concern that uh, our CHAMPS members have is that it's hard to do business in DC. Um, the licensing is hard, the bureaucracy is slow, and the agency databases don't talk to each other. Um, many small business owners have spent hours navigating the bureaucracy, and a lot of them have said to me that they never could have started a business if they didn't have a partner who had a full-time job, a uh, full-time regular job. Um, this, yeah. this hurts the perspective small business owners who may not be well-resourced. Uh, so how would you use your position on the council to make small business ownership easier and more accessible? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned first, I think, the, the issue around making sure that our agencies are as responsive and as helpful to our small business owners and those aspiring to create small business as possible. Um, and when we talk about, I think, the two DC agencies that are the bane of everyone's existence, right, it's, it's the Department of Employment Services and DCRA. And the more we really have council members who are willing to dig deep and figure out how we make those systems work better for those who need them, uh, I think the better it is. You know, I got the opportunity right out of school to work at the Department of Employment Services out of youth programs, uh, but really got to see the whole agency uh, work and, and the difficulty it was to really connect people to work, but also to support those who wanted to hire from the community. So we've got to, we've got to have a council member dedicated to that. I'm going to be dedicated to that work and putting the reforms necessary. When you talk about those systems that don't talk to each other, a lot of those systems were right really good systems in 99 or 2000, uh, but don't talk to each other and aren't very intuitive now. And so not only does it make it hard for the folks engaging with government, it makes it hard for folks working inside government to really keep track of all those systems. So we've got to invest in that infrastructure that allows that to be possible. And then let me just uh, say this very quickly, when we talk about supporting small businesses, especially in communities like the Hill, right, um, and especially in communities where you want to have a brick and mortar presence, right, the high right cost of rent and the high cost of, of getting those placements is also difficult as well, which means that as a government, we've got to support and incentivize as much as possible local residents being able to get subsidies for rent um, uh, across the community that really allows them to build a presence and grow and scale uh, while right that those high over that the high overheads initially can be a barrier uh, to that success. You know, I live in Ward 8 and Anacostia, uh, the Martin Luther King Avenue in Lower Anacostia has one of the highest concentrations of black owned businesses in the city. But what you'll see is as the city transitions and as the community grows around it, they have a very difficult time maintaining their presence because the landlords that are renting to them now want to raise those rents. Uh, they can't afford or don't have the resources or the know-how to buy those buildings to be able to maintain that presence. And the government has had pr pretty much a hands-off approach. We've got to support small businesses, especially now in both being able to sustain themselves, but also as we think about how our economy changes in response to COVID, we've also got to provide more opportunities and incentives for folks to start small businesses. And so I'll be a champion for that for sure, and including for our partners on the Hill. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, with respect to COVID, um, right now businesses are reopening in phase two, um, but sales from many of our storefronts and our restaurants have dropped 40, 50% from where they were last year. Mm -hmm. um, fixed costs of rent and taxes are still due, and a lot of businesses have already spent their paycheck protection funds and their DC micro grant funds. Uh, if you are on the council right now, what are proposals that you would put forward to help our small businesses continue to operate and employ people? Yeah, no, I think that that's really important. You know, we, we've got to, first, I think it's also about providing as many protections for working class folks as possible on the front end so, th so that, right, it's easier, right, on the back end. So when we talk about working class folks in the city, we've got to make sure that during this crisis, folks don't have to, right, worry about uh, maintaining a roof over the head, which means we've got to have protections for home ownership and for rental protections for our residents who are who are feeling the economic pinch. 
uh, it also means uh, that we've got to uh, invest in the health and safety, which means supporting our small businesses uh, and providing PPE for, for employees. It means making sure that uh, our transportation networks are both connected enough and safe enough for workers to be able to travel back and forth uh, to work, especially as we begin to open up more things uh, around the city. Uh, and I think it also means uh, ensuring that uh, we provide or we create programs that allow businesses the room, right, to, to be able to survive, right? I think it, it's, it's scary uh, that so many businesses around this city uh, and around the country, quite frankly, uh, as a result of this crisis, are going to close their doors permanently. Uh, and I think we read headlines right in the city paper and, you know, in the business journal all the time about businesses that we hold very, very dear that aren't going to open their doors again after this. And, and I think if we think about this as both, right, investing and, 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 and holding up our, our economic base, but also if we see, right, our small businesses and those who make our city run as a deeply cultural investment too, uh, I think that there are really creative solutions to, to be able to do that. So I support, uh, again, making sure that where the federal government won't go, where the private sector doesn't have the ability to, the DC government really spend its dollars in a, in a, uh, in a really focused way uh, to make sure that small businesses are able to pay their workers and provide them with the resources they need to be successful in this new environment. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my last question goes to um, parking, residential versus commercial parking on Capitol Hill and, and really everywhere in the district. Um, it's a flashpoint, how you balance the uh, parking needs for our residents, for customers, for business owners and employees. Mm -hmm. uh, where parking is high demand, a lot of employees or um, DC service providers have to just absorb parking tickets as a part of doing business. Um, how would you approach this problem? What are some solutions you might have? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I'm all about making sure that we create the type of, of uh, transportation infrastructure and transportation affordability that makes parking uh, um, less of a priority for folks, right, for sure. Um, and, and when we talk about, especially in communities like the Hill, where not only is the Hill, but the communities around it are just expanding and becoming so much more dense, right? When we talk about the transportation infrastructure, it's going to, that's going to, we're going to need to move people around, but to also keep people safe and alive is, is really important. And so we've got to have a really tough conversation about how we create the infrastructure that, that does that. When it comes to parking, right, I'm all about creating, um, I'm all about using the new economic opportunities that are happening on, in communities like the Hill to also, right, invest in off-street parking uh, to make sure that we can build the type of capacity we need, uh, but also uh, free up as much space as possible on the street to make sure um, that we're able to build the infrastructure, again, that's, that's going to keep people safe. And so I know it's a, it's a very delicate balance. You know, I'm, I, I'd also be open to a conversation about how we creatively do zone parking for, for business owners and employees uh, in some of our, our business zones where right off street parking isn't as possible. I'm thinking of like communities like Barracks Row and some of those places. Um, and, and so, it, you know, and so I think there are creative solutions. Again, we've got to invest again in, in making sure we have the infrastructure to keep people safe, that we do dedicated bike lanes, right, that we make public transportation for our working class folks more affordable um, so that it's cheaper to take the metro work than to put dollars in the tank and drive. Uh, and, and, so, and so we've got to, again, again, there's the front end and back end things that I'm talking about, but, but I think there is a balance and I'm, I'm dedicated to, to figuring out what the appropriate balance is to make sure that our local businesses can thrive and get the business flow they need, but that we're also being hyper-focused on creating the type of broad transportation infrastructure that our city needs as it grows and expands. Great, thank you. Yeah. Oh, and uh, finally, my last question is, what would you name the Washington football team? Um, and do you support a return to RFK to having the football team be based out of there? Yeah, so uh, 
So I didn't really have a good one uh, wow. up until I, I talked to um, my colleague, my, there's, uh, Alex O'Sullivan is one of our student members on the State Board of Education. And I was in a conversation with him the other day. And he was like, you know what would be a really good name? The Washington Red Wolves. And I know that that was on kind of the list of like, <laughs> And I was like, why? I was like, why the Red Wolves? And he was like, could you imagine the howling in the stadium, like at a game? And I'm like, actually, that's pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. So, so if I had a choice, the Rosh the Washington Red Wolves would be great. My second choice would obviously be the Red Tails, which I think pays homage to, uh, to uh, some trailblazers right in the in the African American community. Um, but in terms of their return to RFK. Um, you know, I, uh, I was born the year the, the, the Washington football team won their last Super Bowl. And so I know that there's a generational drift and attachment to the team. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but a, you know, I would love for us to have a hometown football team, but I'm unwilling to trade that for the, what I think is a tremendous opportunity at, at the RFK site to invest in more affordable housing in the amenities that the local community needs. Um, because while I think, uh, you know, there'll be plenty of folks who argue that a, a return to the football team will be an, an important economic base, our number one priority right now has to be getting folks off the street into affordable housing with dignity. And so I would not pass up an opportunity uh, to do that at the RFK site. And from what I hear from, from, uh, from neighbors in Hill East is that they don't want to pass up on that opportunity either. And so I'm, I'm inclined to, to listen to the folks in the local community, but also focus on our city's broader priorities in building affordable housing. Um, um, and uh, I'm also not too keen on, on, the, on the team's owner. Uh, and, so, uh, and so there would have to be a lot of convincing on my part uh, that, that we, could, we could start something fresh here in the city. Um, but again, not willing to pass up on that opportunity at RFK. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us and to share your thoughtful answers. Um, and uh, how can people uh, follow you, contact you, get a hold of you? Sure. So we're asking everybody to learn a bit more about my story, but also about our vision for DC at MarcusForDC.com, M-A-R-K-U-S-F-O-R-D-C.com. Uh, and we're also at Marcus for DC uh, on all social media. Um, so please engage. Uh, everybody should have their ballots before October 1st, if all goes well. Uh, and so every day will be election day uh, for a month. And so we're looking forward to engaging as many neighbors as possible and obviously are open to the opportunity to other neighbors inviting us to engage with their friends and neighbors as well. So please do be in contact with us. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Talk to everyone soon.